Hi, everybody. Welcome to Along Those Lines, a podcast about electric cooperatives, the work they do, and the challenges they face. I'm your host, Scott Hoffman. The monarch butterfly is in trouble. Its numbers have been in decline for decades, its habitat is rapidly declining, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is set to rule on whether it ought to be protected under the Endangered Species Act. But electric co-ops across the country have been doing their part to try and save this iconic species. Today we're talking to Janelle Lemon and Stephanie Crawford, both from NRECA's regulatory division, and later we'll hear from Brad Foss, who's the Environmental Impact Manager at Dairyland Power Cooperative in Wisconsin. Janelle, Stephanie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for talking to us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Okay, so let's start off with the monarch butterfly. The federal government is looking at whether this species ought to be designated as endangered or in peril of some kind. What's the process there? What's the federal government looking at and when are they expected to come out with a ruling? Well, the monarch's been in decline for the last few decades now, and it's been receiving a lot of attention in recent years. And that led to Fish and Wildlife Service being petitioned to list it under the Endangered Species Act by some environmental groups. They petitioned the agency back in 2014, and now the agency has set up a timetable to make that decision, and they're expected to issue their finding in June. If they decide to list it, that decision would not take effect for another year. So we're talking about June or July 2020 when we could see a final decision and ruling take effect. Stephanie, with that designation, you said that an environmental group came forward. What's the process there? A group will come forward and say, we think that this species deserves protection and that automatically triggers an investigation or evaluation of the health of the species? The agency will do a preliminary look at the petition, Mm -hmm. see if it warrants a greater investigation. And they did find that doing that species status assessment was warranted based on the facts that they had at the time. And so now they're going through that longer process, looking at all the threats to the species, looking at the conservation going on already to determine if the monarch warrants having protected status. Okay. That's a good segue to you, Janelle. Why don't you tell us a little bit about, this is a highly iconic species. Everybody recognizes the monarch. They have a unique life cycle and they have a prolific kind of migration pattern. Talk a little bit about what the monarch's life cycle is, why that particular life cycle brings it into co-op territories. As you mentioned, the monarch butterfly is very iconic, very recognizable. It has a very broad range. So it is found across co-op territory from coast to coast in the lower 48, as well as Hawaii. So only co-ops in Alaska don't have the monarch butterfly in their service territory. Everyone else could potentially see an impact from a potential uh, listing under the Endangered Species Act. So monarch butterflies, there's actually three different populations in the continental U.S. So there's a population in Florida that are non-migratory, so they stay there year-round. There's a western population, which live west of the Rocky Mountains, and they're considered short migrators. So they overwinter in the forests along the California coastline and then migrate back and forth up to the Rocky Mountains. Then there's an eastern population, which is found east of the Rockies all the way to the east coast, and that's the population that's really iconic and known for its complex, multi-generational, long-distance migration. So they spend their winters in central Mexico and And it takes three to four generations annually to complete their life cycle and go through overwintering, their spring migration, summering, uh, which is where they complete their reproductive life cycle. Um, and then they migrate back to, to Mexico in the fall. So they come out of Mexico and they and they begin migrating north. Talk a little bit about what the process is there. They're going into these co-op territories or these rural territories and their populations are struggling. What's what's going on with that? In the early spring, so February, March time frame, the adult monarchs are leaving Mexico and journeying north, and they arrive in South Texas and other parts of the southeast, and that's when they're completing their first reproduction life cycle. So they're mating, laying eggs on milkweed species, which is the host plant for the monarch butterfly. Once the eggs hatch after a couple of weeks, it turns into a caterpillar. The caterpillars munch on the milkweed leaves, and then they transform, uh, turning into a chrysalis, and that's where they hatch or come out and become an adult monarch. And so once it becomes an adult monarch, they continue that journey north into the upper Midwest, lower Canada, That actually takes two more iterations of that life cycle. 
And then the fourth generation, which will be found in the northern parts of the U.S., are the ones that, once they arrive to their summer breeding ground, these are the ones that are called the migratory adults. Wow. And they live eight to nine months, and they're making the full journey back down to Mexico to overwinter. Um, and that's about 3,000 miles wow. versus the other generations are only living, you know, maybe two to five weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a really unique, complex life cycle. It takes four separate butterflies to complete those phases and return back to their wintering grounds in Mexico. Right. You mentioned that milkweed is, is a critical plant species in the life cycle of a monarch. What's going on with that particular species that's making it difficult for monarchs to thrive? There's actually over 200 different types of milkweed across the landscape, and the caterpillars depend on that for their food. When they're eating the milkweed, it contains a toxin that once the caterpillar eats it and they become an adult butterfly, it makes them untasty to their predators. So right. things like lizards and birds that may be wanting to munch on a butterfly for a snack it doesn't make them taste good. There has been a big decline of milkweed across the landscape for a number of reasons. Things like agriculture, conversion of land uses, that's led to the decline of milkweed availability. Okay. The Fish and Wildlife Service is the one that's looking at this designation. They have multiple options on how to designate a species once they've started an investigation. What's at stake here for electric cooperatives? If the monarch is listed, it could have a huge impact on co-ops. As Janelle mentioned, it has the monarch has a huge range, and so we expect it to impact all co-ops except those in Alaska. And if it is listed, Fish and Wildlife can impose restrictions that could significantly uh, impact how co-ops do vegetation management on their systems. So in terms of maintaining their lines for reliability, fish and wildlife could cause changes in mowing in terms of timing and different mowing practices. Right. Pesticide and herbicide use, they could impact the timing and different pesticides they could use. Also, if co-ops have lines intersecting with federal lands, if they have a federal nexus there, they would be required to consult with federal agencies on the species, consult on the impact of their projects to the species. Mm -hmm. This can result in uh, additional time for permitting, delays, additional costs. Federal agencies could require different things, so it definitely could have a different impact across the board. Co-ops have known that this is coming, that some designation ruling by the federal government is coming for a while. Janelle, talk about some of the stuff that they've been working on in order to, to show the federal government, A, that they're trying to help the monarch, but B, just to help a species that they consider a, a valuable species to their territories. Many co-ops have been proactively taking steps to conserve the monarch butterfly as well as other pollinators and wildlife. For example, we have members across the landscape that are putting in pollinator plots at solar farms or at their headquarters or substation facilities. Others are evaluating putting in habitat um, along their utility rights of way. In addition, others have put in pollinator habitat, so that's things like nectaring plants right. that the adult monarchs rely on, as well as milkweeds that are important for the caterpillar. Also, we have members that are altering their routine vegetation management practices, so they're integrating practices that are beneficial for monarchs and other wildlife. So that is, like Stephanie was mentioning, changing their timing of mowing practices right. and how they're applying herbicides on the landscape. And there's been a recent development within the last month. The Fish and Wildlife Service is in the process of looking at what's called a, help me on this, Stephanie, what's it called? A CCAA. Okay. And that stands for? Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances. Okay. Talk about what that is and how that helps co-ops get a little bit of certainty as this goes forward. NRECA has been participating in a working group that has developed the CCAA, which is a voluntary conservation agreement that will be available to the energy and transportation sectors to benefit the monarch butterfly. And we've done this in partnership with the Fish and Wildlife Service, so they have had input into the development of the agreement. NRECA has participated to make sure that co-ops have their perspective uh, represented as the agreement came together. And this agreement, we really think, has a lot of benefits 
benefits because co-ops can commit up front to do voluntary conservation for the monarch. And in exchange, Fish and Wildlife Service agrees that they will not require any additional actions to be taken by co-ops that are involved if the monarch is listed in the future. And so it really can provide a lot of benefits in terms of regulatory certainty for the long run. Great. And are we actively encouraging co-ops to study whether they want to be involved in, in the CCA? We are. We are. We're working with a lot of members first to give input into the development of the agreement, but especially now we want to get the word out to as many members as possible about the benefits of the agreement and how this can help limit costs, streamline the conservation measures that co-ops would do across their system, and limit consultations needed with federal agencies going forward on the Monarch. What other kind of steps has NRECA been doing to help the program overall respond to this particular challenge. Did we help write that CCAA? Yeah, we provided definitely feedback into the terms of the agreement. We advocated for flexibility for co-ops. So in particular, we advocated for what's called a consortium application. So groups of co-ops can get together and apply. So we see that primarily being a GNT with its distribution co-ops or potentially a statewide organization applying for its distribution members and then helping to share the cost amongst themselves and helping to share with the administrative effort involved in terms of reporting the conservation they're doing. How does a co-op get involved in this? Did they go through NRECA or did they go directly to Fish and Wildlife? They can go directly to the University of Illinois Chicago, which is the programmatic administrator for this agreement. So they will manage the permit, essentially, that Fish and Wildlife Service will issue for the agreement. They'll manage that relationship with the agency back and forth. And then a co-op that's involved in the CCAA would send its reporting annually in terms of what it's doing on the ground for the monarch to the university. Is it normal for a university or a third party to... Well, administer? Well, this is the largest CCAA that has ever come together. So it's really unique in terms of it's nationwide. The entire lower 48 states are represented across the participants so far. The university manages a working group that NRECA is members of, and it's called the Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group. So that group focuses on a lot of information exchange, sharing best practices amongst professionals and that manage Rights of Way. What if there's no listing? What if they determine that it does not need to be listed? If the agency determines that it doesn't need to be listed, I think we can say with relative certainty that that decision will be challenged in the courts. So we see uncertainty going forward in terms of how that will play out. And for co-ops, I think this means that continuing to do the proactive things they're doing already for the monarch and other pollinators is really important to show that that conservation is ongoing, but also because this issue is not going away. Uh, There are several other pollinators in decline, and they have multi-state ranges. So we know Fish and Wildlife Service is going to be making decisions on those in the coming years, and the conservation for the monarch will benefit those pollinators as well. Brad Foss is a longtime employee of Dairyland Power Cooperative in Wisconsin, and among his many duties, he oversees the co-op's efforts to provide habitat for pollinators like the monarch. Brad, welcome. Oh, it's my pleasure. Dairyland has been doing these pollinator habitat projects for a long time. What made the co-op get involved Back in 1994 is when we kind of got into it, and we were in the process of closing or capping a coal ash landfill that we had, and common practice at that time was to cap it and generally seed the landfill with a generic mix of road vegetation, basically. And the supervisor that I had at that time, he was kind of a forward-thinking gentleman. He was really into prairies and prairie restoration. So we kicked around the idea of seeding the cap with a a mix of native prairie grasses and forbs. So back then, it wasn't really called a pollinator plot. It was more prairie establishment or prairie restoration. So we took that idea, and uh, we went to the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. We wanted to make sure that uh, they were going to be okay with it because it was... uh, a little different seeding mix that you know we would typically use. And once we got their blessing, we worked with Prairie Restorations, who is a consulting firm out of the Twin Cities area. They do a lot of pollinator habitat improvement plots and prairie restoration. They came up with a seed mix that would be appropriate for the site, and they handled all the site prep and seeding. Uh, that was done in the fall of 1994. About a 38-acre site, and when it was all said and done, uh, the area was seeded with over 40 different kinds of native 
prairie grasses and forbs. So another thing that, you know, Prairie Restoration came up with at that time was they put together a, a 10-year management plan for the prairie that included a number of different practices such as rotational mowing, prescribed burns, weed whipping, spot spraying, and nuisance vegetation. And that's really one of the critical factors when you're uh, working with these pollinator plots is they take three to five years to get established and somewhat reach maturity. So you've got to put a lot of time and effort into the, the early stages of it. And we still actually have prairie restoration on contract. They come out one or two times a year, make site visits. Um, we actually just burned that prairie last week, as a matter of fact. So that's been a really good project for us. And that's kind of how we got involved with pollinator plots. Okay. And since then, you branched out well beyond the coal ash caps and, and into rights of way. And you have solar installations where you're putting these things around as well? We do. We do. We have an agreement with uh, CMS Energy and NG to purchase power from a number of different solar projects within our, our service territory. And each of these solar arrays has a pollinator plot associated with it. So um, the total acreage for all those pollinator plots is around 250 acres. Talk a little bit about how you go about uh, not only siting, but actually building one of these projects. What's the process involved with actually laying one of these down? Probably the best example I can give you would be the pollinator plots that we're looking at establishing next to our substations that we have. Generally, what we do is we do a little desktop analysis and we look at a number of different substations, aerial photographs and so forth. And we also look at kind of the site characteristics as far as, you know, if the substation is near a municipality and we're required to do a lot of mowing at that substation to keep the grass down and so forth. That will be uh, kind of a substation that we're, we're looking for to maybe develop into a pollinator plot. Mm -hmm. We're also looking for substations that would be maybe next to a, a municipality or have homes adjacent to it. And the rationale for that is, is we really want to get the word out to the public about uh, the plight of the pollinators and what Dairyland is, is doing to kind of help the cause, so to speak. So once we've identified a site that we um, think is super suitable for pollinator habitat. We'll generally get in contact with Prairie Restoration, talk to them a little bit about the site. They'll come out, make a site visit. They'll look at the type of soil that's at the site, the geographic region and so forth. And they'll put together a seed mix uh, that fits all that criteria. And they'll put together a, a management plan. They'll send us the proposal. And typically the proposal will be a, a four-year plan where the first year will be site preparation, seeding, and then and uh, there'll be three years of follow-up maintenance that will be included with that. So once we decide to move forward, the cost is a question I get quite often when talking about pollinator plots. What does it what does it cost to try and get these going? And it's very variable. Our experience at Dairyland has been that to prepare and seed a site can run anywhere from twenty two hundred to thirty five hundred dollars per acre. And if you would factor in three years of maintenance, the project price will increase from twenty five hundred to probably fifty five hundred dollars per acre. So to give you an example of that, if we have a two acre site that we're looking to develop and maintain for three years, the cost would be anywhere from five thousand to eleven thousand dollars. And I wish I could, you know, be a little more precise with our numbers, but some of the factors that kind of weigh into that variability are the size of the site. Typically if you have a larger site, it's a little more cost effective for a consulting firm to come out and and, and do the work as opposed to mobilizing all the equipment and, and coming out for a smaller site. Would you say generally, if you were advising another co-op, that these are not necessarily an onerous thing to do? They're a manageable project if that's what your co-op wants to do? Yeah, they, they really are. I think, um, you know, when you first get into it, like anything else, it, it may seem a little little overbearing at times, but once you get one or two sites under your belt and kind of get a process or procedure down, it is, uh, it is pretty straightforward. And we've had really good luck with the consulting firms that we've worked with. So yeah, I think uh, just initially, it's, you know, kind of the fear of the unknown. How do I get going on this? You know, what's it going to take to get going? But once you, you know, have a couple of them under your belt, it kind of becomes turnkey at a point, I think. 
You mentioned earlier how one of the motivations is to get them near residential areas so you can get the word out about the plight of the pollinators. And I wonder, is Dairyland's commitment to this a philosophical commitment? It sounds like it transcends the policy implications of this. You know, it isn't really being driven by any one thing. You know, right now, the monarch butterfly and the potential listing, I think, is is driving the construction or the establishment of a lot of uh, pollinator habitat projects where our Ours are, we haven't really, I guess, constructed ours with one single species in mind. Our scope has always been more broad than that, I felt, where mm -hmm. we've seen, you know, habitat degradation through the years from uh, development and so forth. And, uh, you know, our goal has always been to, you know, try and uh, reclaim some of that habitat, reestablish some of that habitat and, uh, you know, help out as many species as we can. So it really hasn't been driven by, by any one uh, insect or any one species. The kind of feedback you're getting from your member systems, are they helping drive this forward? Are they appreciative of you doing it? Or do they are they saying, put one of these in my territory? The feedback that we've gotten on our efforts has been really positive across the board. I know that we've received inquiries from other utilities, from our member co-ops, from schools, and just the public on our program, you know, what we're doing, how we're doing it. Uh, you know, we get a lot of uh, compliments on what our efforts, and we get a lot of questions, too, on how to we get started? How can another group go ahead and get started in it? So I think when you get that positive feedback like that, that also helps you progress your own program because you are getting positive reinforcement from the public and, and member co-ops and things like that. So it just makes you want to do more and you know participate even more in, in programs like that. Fish and Wildlife Service is about to come out with, in the next month or so, come out with a ruling on whether the monarch ought to be classified as endangered or threatened. Do you feel like Dairyland at this point is in pretty good compliance position, uh, regardless of what the, the designation might be? I really do. And I think that you know, we've always had strong support at Dairyland at the executive level for environmental stewardship and conservation efforts. And I think you really need that base or that support to initiate and move forward with sustainability components such as a pollinator program. So our executive team really understands that environmental stewardship is part of doing business in today's world and that as environmental conditions or regulations change, Dairyland as a cooperative needs to evolve to meet these demands and the expectations of our customers. So, you know, I think Dairyland is, is in a good position position, anything that, that we aren't doing that we would need to change to comply, I really feel that uh, there's going to be strong support for that from our executive staff. That's been uh, one of the things that I've been really proud of here at Dairyland is the strong environmental conscience that the, the cooperative has. Brad, thanks so much for being on the program. All right. Thanks very much to my guests, and thanks as well to you, our listeners. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app and look for information about this and other podcasts on our website, electric.coop. Till next time, for Along Those Lines, I'm Scott Hoffman.